What is a geodesic? If you've sought an answer to this question before, you might have encountered a few different explanations. One is that a geodesic is the straightest possible path on a curved surface. Technically true, but altogether not very helpful since the notion of straightness on a curved surface is an analogous, not literal, one. Another explanation is that a geodesic is the shortest possible path between any two points on a curved surface. But this is only provisionally true, since there are many geodesics which do not form the shortest path between two points, such as this geodesic which traverses a hill-like surface. Lastly, there's the precise explanation of a geodesic, which is that it is a stationary path. But unless you have a background in advanced mathematics, that's also not generally a very helpful answer. So how can we understand geodesics then? Well, let's start at the somewhat vague idea that, given a curved surface, a geodesic is the straightest possible path upon it. Now, the first thing you should ask yourself is, straight relative to what? Indeed, given this ambiguous definition, if you saw this line of latitude on a sphere, you might reasonably believe it's a geodesic. After all, it's straight relative to your eye line. Of course, should you know a little more about the subject, you may know that only curves which lie on great circles of a sphere are geodesics. But why? What makes this curve straighter than this one? Well, the answer to this question lies in the fact that the straightness of these curves is determined relative to the curved surface itself. To understand what this means, let's start by considering a straight line on a flat surface. Now, this line is a geodesic, but it's not a geodesic simply because it's straight or the shortest path between its endpoints. Rather, it's a geodesic because it shares in the same curvature profile as the surface beneath it. In this case, flatness. Indeed, should we choose to draw a path that bends away from this line, it would not be a geodesic since now it has curvature relative to the surface. Similarly, we can consider the line and plane again, but now warped together through 3D space. At this point, although the line is curved through 3D space, it doesn't have any additional curvature relative to the surface. Therefore, it constitutes a geodesic. Again, should we choose to draw a path that bends away from this line, it would not be a geodesic, since now it has curvature relative to the surface. Another way to understand this is to imagine you're driving a tiny car over this surface. If you drive along a path that doesn't ever require you to turn your steering wheel, then this path is a geodesic. Meanwhile, if the path you drive does require that you turn your steering wheel, then it's not a geodesic. Hence, we see that when we say a geodesic is the straightest possible path, what we really mean is that the curving of the path matches the curving of the surface itself, i.e. the two share the same curvature profile. Thus, it should start to make sense that a great circle on a sphere is always a geodesic, because a spherical surface is generated by revolving such a great circle about its center. And thus, a great circle always curves in the same manner as the surface itself. Consequently, the problem of whether a path on a curved surface is a geodesic or not boils down to whether the curvature of the path can be matched to the curvature of the surface. But of course, this suggests a new difficulty, which is, given an arbitrary surface, how do we determine its curvature? Well, we'll let you in on a little secret. In differential geometry, there's actually no such thing as a curved surface. Rather, everything relies on the concept of local flatness. The idea that any curved surface essentially becomes flat if you zoom in close enough. 
This is rather like how your computer never actually renders a curved surface, but instead compiles an approximation from thousands of tiny polygons stitched together. For all intents and purposes, differential geometry works the same way. A fact which can greatly simplify the problem of identifying whether a given curve on a surface is a geodesic or not. As an example, let's consider a line of longitude and latitude that intersect on a sphere. To determine which of these curves is a geodesic and which isn't, we'll first zoom our camera in real close. Then we'll fix our view such that its orientation is as perpendicular to the surface as possible. Now, thanks to local flatness, we can treat this portion of the surface as a flat background, against which the straightness of any traversing paths can be judged. And, well, notice something? Our line of longitude here looks perfectly straight. But the line of latitude appears curved. Indeed, slapping a Cartesian grid down on this local patch, we see that this line of latitude curves in the manner of a large circle relative to the grid, which of course indicates that it is not a geodesic. In contradistinction, we see that the line of longitude does, at least in this vicinity, travel in a straight line as a geodesic. Now what's pretty cool is that you can repeat this method for any path on any curved 2D surface to determine whether it's a possible geodesic or not. However, there is a slight hitch. On our sphere, for instance, while the line of longitude appears straight and the line of latitude appears curved from this distance, zoom in even closer, and now both these lines will appear straight. To solve this problem, formally speaking, you'd have to dive into the conceptualism of stationary paths. But that leads into complex mathematical territory, and for the moment, we're just building intuition. So let's try another approach to understanding why something like a line of latitude isn't quite a geodesic. To do this, let's step away from the sphere for a moment and turn to a new object, a cone. A cone has a special type of curvature known as purely extrinsic curvature. This means that although it curves through 3D space, there's a way to unwrap a cone into a flat plane without distorting any portion of the surface. Hence, we can identify curves on this cone as geodesics or not, simply by unwrapping the cone and judging the straightness of the resultant paths. Now, our sphere, on the other hand, has both extrinsic and intrinsic curvature. So it can't be unwrapped into a plane without distorting it. However, we can now leverage what we know about our cone in order to glean more information about our line of latitude. Indeed, for any line of latitude on a sphere, we can fit to it a cone whose surface is perfectly tangent to the sphere along every point of that latitude line. Doing this and then transferring the line of latitude from the sphere to the cone thus gives us the same curved latitude path. But now, instead of this path being fixed to an intrinsically curved surface, it's fixed to a purely extrinsic one. This means that to determine whether this path is a geodesic or not, all we need to do next is simply unwrap the cone. And voila! Now we can not only see that this line of latitude is not a geodesic, but we can also observe that its true geometry relative to its surface is that of a circle. Think about it for a minute. It's pretty fascinating. This means if you ever walk directly east or directly west on the surface of the Earth, you aren't walking in a straight line. Rather, you're constantly turning, either to your left or to your right. Indeed, if we place our car on the surface of a sphere and ask it to drive along a line of latitude, it couldn't do so while keeping its wheels straight. Instead, it would have to continually keep turning, just as if it were driving in a circle. Now, the entirety of Riemannian geometry is wrapped up in this exact trick. That is, in converting intrinsic geometry to purely extrinsic geometry. Only, this essentially occurs on an infinitesimal level. 
To understand this, remember again that, because of our local flatness assumption, we can treat any curved surface as many tiny flat surfaces stitched together. Given our sphere, for instance, let's now approximate it via a number of flat quadrilaterals. Next, to determine our geodesics, we need to find a way to transpose any path upon the sphere onto a purely extrinsic or flat surface, which can be done very simply if we approach it in a piecewise fashion. For example, given some initial location on this sphere, let's say we want to start out moving due east along a line of latitude. But this time, we don't want to keep moving along that direction. Instead, we want to move along a geodesic, that is, along the straightest possible path relative to the surface. So how can we accomplish this? Obviously, for the first flat quadrilateral portion of the surface, we can deduce that our path will simply be a straight line eastwards. But what happens when we hit the edge? How do we know which path to take along the next piece in order to keep going as straight as possible? Well, let's say we disconnect these two pieces from the rest of the sphere. If considered in isolation, this resultant surface does not feature any intrinsic curvature, but rather just purely extrinsic curvature. So, just as we did with the cone, we can simply unwrap this surface, that is, bend these two pieces until they lie flat in the same plane. With this accomplished, we now know exactly which path to continue along in order to keep moving in a straight line. Next, we can simply rebend the pieces back to their original orientation, refit them back to the sphere, and voila! Now we know the straightest possible path. If we simply repeat this process for the next two adjacent pieces, and then again for the next two, and so on, We'll be well on our way to approximating a great circle geodesic for our sphere. Of course, to make it precise, we must make our pieces smaller and smaller, eventually infinitesimally so. But the neat thing is that this process works for any arbitrary surface, regardless of its curvature. Indeed, simply choose a starting point on that surface, choose a starting direction, and then, by approximating that surface via many tiny flat surfaces, unfold and refold adjacent pieces to determine the straightest possible path. And that's it. That's all there is to the magic of geodesics. Well, okay, there's still more to unpack here. In the next video, we'll have to make all this mathematically precise in order to derive the geodesic equation. And we'll need to look into the extension of these concepts to higher dimensional manifolds, as well as to pseudo-Riemannian manifolds. But ultimately, the tools developed here will give us a powerful way to render concrete some of the most abstract and difficult concepts of differential geometry, including connections, parallel transport, and ultimately, the Riemannian curvature tensor. So don't worry, there's plenty of non-Euclidean fun still ahead. This has been Dialect. Thanks for watching.